Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Dark Travels hostess. Tonight, we travel to our second American stop, New Orleans or Nolens. Now, I've been to this vibrant city by the old Mississippi, and boy, do we have a lot to cover today. First, a little cultural understanding. New Orleans has a wonderful mixture of African American, French, and Spanish influences. Both the French and the Spanish ruled the city before the United States snatched it up along with the rest of the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million to Napoleon Bonaparte. And added to this mixture of culture and races, of course, we have the slaves from both Africa and the West Indies. Later, the Irish, Germans, and Latins would join this population. Now, many focus on the Creole and Cajun populations. For a brief understanding of which is which, Creole people are primarily people of French and Spanish descent born in the colony. And the Cajun people? Well, they're a group of French Canadians expelled by the British from Canada. And so they moved on down the old Mississippi and settled in the swamplands and bayous of Louisiana. But all of them... All of these cultures, of course, combine to make this Crescent City the wonderful place that it is now. So let's start plotting and planning our dark travels of Nolens. We'll begin with my favorite place to roam about. Let's start off with St. Louis Cemetery Number 1 and the tomb of the famous voodoo priestess Marie Laveau. Miss Laveau was born in 1801. She was half Creole. And she was a hairdresser, believe it or not, who became a famous proprietor of charms, grease grease bags, fortunes, and advice. When she died in 1881, she was buried, or supposedly buried, at St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. Like I said, though, I've heard it repeatedly that this is actually not her grave site, although there is a mausoleum there, which I can understand why. Being as popular as she was in life and people coming to her mausoleum and, and giving her offerings, you know, bothering her in the afterlife, I could see why her family would say this is it. But in reality, she's buried somewhere else. Either way, as for the cemetery itself, it was open for business in 1789 and is the oldest cemetery in New Orleans. It has over 600 tombs. And as I've personally walked cemetery I can attest to the beauty of this old cemetery now as I said before it's supposedly her tomb and you actually can find it because it will be decorated with candles and coins and trinkets basically people again making offers asking for something asking for a favor and because of all of these coins and trinkets and candles it's actually kind of hard to miss if you're looking for it Located at 425 Basin Street, you can only get inside the cemetery if you book a tour. Now, in 1827, Marie actually gave birth to a daughter whom she named Marie. Today, there is a voodoo museum and a shop at the very house Marie Laveau II, the daughter, lived. So, being part of this museum, you can see the voodoo altar and various items to help you learn all about voodoo as well as learn about the practicing spiritual and religious ceremony aspects of it. As a specialty shop, they sell tribal masks, statues, talismans, charms, mojo and ritual bags, 
and voodoo dolls for all those pieces of shit's ex that you have or rotten asshole bosses. But, you know, whomever. They also offer a selection of psychic and spiritual readings every day. Obviously, contacting the shop directly via their website is the best way to schedule a reading. Located at 703 Urban Street, it is open every day from 12 p.m. until closing. That's directly from their website. I don't know what the closing hour is. But if you are super lucky, you might actually see the ghost of Marie number two because it is said that Marie, the daughter, has been known to make her ghostly appearance in the back portion of the building where the readings are done. Apparently, she's not much of a fan of the fact that her house has been turned into this museum slash specialty shop. But either way, this is one place you definitely may want to check out. Now, if you're an Originals fan, our next place will definitely be something that would intrigue you. The Boutique des Vampires. This boutique mixes business with pleasure as it welcomes all of those from both the voodoo and the vampire realm. In this shop, you can find some awesome oddities as shrunken heads, a vampire kit, some vampire adventures, some morbidly cool jewelry, and for your cup of tea, sugar skulls. (laughs) I actually thought those were quite cute. And rumor has it, if you get to chatting to the pale staff, you might get invited to one of their private clubs where entry is only allowed if you get invited or accompanied by a vampire. Accompanied or gorged by a vampire. I don't know. But either way, come prepared with a steak, and I don't mean the medium rare kind, guys. And speaking of death, if you have the stomach for it, I offer you our next museum, the Museum of Death. Per their website, they have artworks from serial killers, mortician and coroner's instruments, some Manson family memorabilia, some pet death taxidermy, crime scene photos, body bags, car accident photographies, and much, much more. Also, per their website, all the items showcased in their museum is authentic. In other words, no replicas. The Museum of Death offers a self-guided tour lasting about 45 minutes to an hour. However, If you can stomach it, you can stay as long as you like. There are hundreds of items on display. So, it would be to your advantage to arrive at least an hour before closing. Now, there is no age limit on the Museum of Death, but they strongly, and strongly is in capital, guys, recommend this museum for only the mature audiences as some of the contents of the exhibits may be a bit graphic or explicit for children. In fact, they they have what they refer to as a number of falling down ovations, you know, people fainting throughout the years because of the, the type of context that they have on ex- display. And so they strongly encourage you to prepare yourself before arriving. I mean, it is the Museum of Death. So you're going to see a lot of deathly related things. Admission is $15. Their hours of operation is Wednesday through Monday, closed on Tuesday. They open at 10 and close at 6. Located in the French Quarter or 221 Dolphin Street. You, again, need to be prepared because anything called the Museum of Death probably really means it. Okay. So, we have covered voodoos, we have covered vampires, we have covered death. Let's talk about a museum that kind of brings it all together. I am talking about the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. Now, I know, initially that kind of sounds like something that wouldn't be interesting. But guys, I would never steer you wrong. Per the website, and of course I'm quoting, they have show globes, method of administration, opium, perfumes and cosmetics, voodoo potions, questionable medical practices, surgical instruments, patent medicines, soda fountain, prescriptions, and compounding. Basically, what this museum has is 200 years 
of the history of cures for anything that ails you, including, like I said before, voodoo potions and other weird medicines. And I'm talking about such absurd medication as gold and silver plated pills or chocolate covered opium pills. Now, (laughs) thanks to COVID, which they don't, by the way, have a cure for, (laughs) they only operate on appointments online with a self-guided tour. You must schedule your reservation online in advance and it only costs $5 for the entrance. I've gone to TripAdvisor, I looked at the reviews, and a lot, a lot of rave reviews. And as cool and as macabre as it is, it is actually located at the site of the very first apothecary shop, very first licensed apothecary shop in the entire country at 514 Chartres Street in New Orleans. And they do have these things, the silver and gold-plated pills. I mean, honestly... Chocolate covered opium pills. All right. So, moving forward and kind of stepping away from the dark places of New Orleans, the, the, the macabre places, I'd like to touch really quickly on another valuable museum that I think is worthy of mentioning. That would be the Edgar de Goss Museum. As we've mentioned before, Edgar de Goss was the painter, very familiar and well known where the ballerina impressionists in Paris, where he is buried. However, while he was born in France in 1834, he actually came to New Orleans for five months from 1872 to 1873 at the Creole estate of his mother's family in New Orleans. Now, despite his mother dying when Nagas was a child, he still had family in New Orleans, and it's during this particular stay that five months from 1872 to 1873, the Degas produced 22 paintings, including the painting A Cotton Office in New Orleans. It is also believed that while in New Orleans, he began to explore a more looser style of painting that would evolve into what we consider as Impressionism. Now, over time and poor business deals, the Degas family actually lost the home And eventually the home was split into two different homes because that's how big the house was. However, the sense of the Degas family and the Musum family worked together. I believe the Musum family was the one that bought the property down the line. They worked together to bring the two properties back into one. And now one half serves as a bed and breakfast while the other portion serves as the Degas studio and bedroom, which is has been restored the way it would have have looked during his visit and has made it into a museum. So this is, like, awesome. On one half is a bed and breakfast that you can stay in, and the other half is the museum that if you stay in the bed and breakfast, you will have free access to. So a visit to this particular museum includes a documentary video with historical details on both the family and the artworks that Degas created while in New Orleans. The museum, graphics, and mimosas are all complimentary. Again, if you are staying as a guest on the one half of the building. However, if you don't stay here, that's okay because you also can have graphics and tour there as well. They actually offer a variety of fun food options. And yes, they actually do weddings there. Obviously, Because of COVID, things are kind of limited, so maybe not right now. But in the future, when the vaccines come out, I'm sure they'll be offering that as well. Either way, this this, if you look at the pictures, guys, it is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And it's located at 2306 Esplanade Avenue. Check out their website. Poke around and schedule a wonderful breakfast and tour if, if you're staying somewhere else. But... If you are thinking about staying here on my Bessie TripAdvisor, it is currently receiving four out of five stars. And like I said, look at the museum website. Oh, this place is absolutely gorgeous. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different museums in a very short amount of time. Just one more museum is on our list. And again, like the Edgar Tagas one, it is not a dark corner. In fact, I would argue this museum honors America's most brightest moment in history. I am, of course, referring to the World War II Museum. 
Initially intended to be a museum that focused solely on D-Day, Operation Overlord, the Normandy invasion of the Allies to take Europe back from the fascist dictators and the goddamn Nazis. Now, I have personally been to this museum. To go through it thoroughly, you will need a few hours. And I believe since my visit, they've expanded it. In fact, it is considered a campus now. This is how big it's gotten. So you have a couple options. You can get the complete campus pass, or you can purchase the pass that gives you access to the galleries and the pavilions only. Uh, But like everything else, you absolutely have to schedule your visit online as they are, of course, COVID conscious. Admissions for adults, they kind of range from $26.50 to $28.50. If you're a senior, again, it ranges from $22.50 to $24.50. If you are military with ID, 16 to $18. If you're a college student, again, with ID, 16 to $18. If you're a child, anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade, 16 to $18. Any children under five is free, and any World War II veteran is free as well. Now, this place is located at 945 Magazine Street. It is open daily from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now, remember, because this is America, (laughs) you can visit all of these places either by Uber, by Lyft, hailing a cab, walking, or renting a bike. I think they have bike rentals down there. So, after all of these museums, naturally, after checking out all of these wonderful places, you're probably going to get a little hungry, and you're probably going to want to check out some of the awesome and unique places to eat. So, let's talk beignets as that is certainly one thing you'll definitely want to try whilst in New Orleans. Let's start with the Café du Monde. The Café du Monde is situated at the original Café du Monde coffee stand that was established in 1862. The café is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It closes only on Christmas Day. But, awesome awesome. Many claim that vampire ghosts and zombie ghosts have been seen from this vantage point looking towards the Mississippi and Jackson Square. And there is a ghost waiter that takes your orders and then disappears. His name is Blue. So the original Café Mondu was a traditional coffee shop. Today, the menu consists of dark roasted coffee and chicory and beignets, white and milk chocolate, and freshly squeezed orange juice. The coffee is served black or a latte, a latte meaning that it's mixed with half and half with hot milk. And beignets, in case you don't know, are the French-style donuts that are lavishly covered with powdered sugar. Located at 1039 Cantor Street, this place is the place to be, it's the place to eat, And it is literally right next to the Mississippi, and you can see Jackson Square from it. I've, as I have had a trip there and I've been to New Orleans, I've actually eaten here at the Cafe de Mon. Um, Very, very wonderful beignets, without a doubt. And it's certainly one of the two that I know that I ate there, (laughs) beignet-wise. And it was delicious. Now, for something a little bit more scale, let's talk about Brennan's Restaurant. Located at 417 Royal Street, this restaurant opened for business in 1946, so a year after the war ended. This restaurant is highly revered, and its menu is highly regarded throughout the world. But for us ghost hunters and paranormal seekers, it also offers something else, ghosts. In the Red Room, the upstairs portion of the restaurant. It is said that the spirit of a former owner is still in this room. According to legend, sometime in the 18th century, the previous owner, a monsieur Le Fleur, calmly went out one morning and arranged for three funerals. When he returned home, he killed his wife, and then he killed his son before hanging himself from the elaborate brass chandelier still hanging in the red room. Now the portraits of the three Lafleur family members decorate the walls currently in the red room. And it is believed 
that Mr. Lefler, Monsieur Lefler, sometimes seems to change his expression every time you glance at it. In addition to this, people have even complained of cold spots in this room. There is also a report of a mysterious, misty figure who literally haunts the staff the entire time they're working upstairs. Patrons who have rented the room, the Red Room, for special events have also reported the ghostly image of a man dressed in a 17th century clothing, watching them disapprovingly at the festivities. Some have even encountered uh, uh, the, the feeling of his presence and anger and foreboding sense just outside the main door to the Red Room. Other active spirits that is said to also haunt this particular restaurant is the ghost of the late chef Paul Blanche. Now, it was Chef Paul who created many of the Brennan's signature dishes and helped build the reputation of this restaurant. And naturally, it is believed that he haunts, of course, the kitchen. Staff have said they have the feeling of being watched. They have been touched. And and an unknown entity likes to bang on the pots and the doors when the kitchen is otherwise empty. And if that isn't enough, Apparitions have also been seen. But Chief, but Chef Paul does not haunt alone. Another former employee named Herman, Herman Funk, is also said to haunt the restaurant. Funk was the wine master, and staff do not like getting wine from the wine rack alone. In fact, it is believed that every time an employee accidentally clinks, the wine bottle glasses, there is a mimicking clink from another wine bottle just out of reach. This mimicking clink is actually believed to be Herman Funk making his suggestion for a wine selection. So basically, from top to bottom, this place has its shares of ghosts and an incredible menu guaranteed to make it memorable even if The ghosts are just chilling for the night. Now, if you've already done the beignet thing, and you've had a great meal, and you just want a nightcap, let's talk about Lafitte's Blacksmith Bar. Built between 1722 and 1732, this bar is believed to be the oldest structure used as a bar in America. Now, Jean Lafitte once owned this building during his multi-career as a pirate, as a privateer, and as a smuggler. The ghost of John Lafitte is said to wander here, and when he appears, he makes a full-body apparition and tends to watch people. His choice of uh, appearing preferences is actually near the fireplace, but he is not alone. Whereas he likes to haunt and glare at people on the first floor, there is actually another ghostly presence on the second floor. Now, nobody knows who this ghost is, but it is believed that it is the ghost of a woman who lived there in the 1890s. It is rumored that she killed herself, of course, upstairs. And while she has only shown herself on a handful of occasions, she apparently is more vocal. She's a bit more talkative. In fact, she likes to whisper your name in your ear when you are completely alone late at night. And if these two ghosts aren't enough, there is another phenomenon which is associated with this haunted bar. I am talking about the phantom red eyes. These bright, piercing red eyes always seem to be in the dark corners of Lafitte. And it is said if you make eye contact with them, they will simply fade away so if you are brave enough you can find this charming place located at 941 bourbon street so now that we've had our nightcap with our red demon eyes let's talk about places to stay when i visited here we stayed at the andrew jackson hotel now this place was selected because of its reputation for being haunted i did my research As we settled in for the night, my traveling companion thought it was a wise idea to taunt the ghosts. Well, after saying some provocative things, our fire alarm went off. 
and continued to beep to the point that we had to relocate rooms because the staff could not stop the bleeping. (laughs) So off we went off to another room, and in the morning, I had hoped that by then the beeping had stopped. It did not. I gathered my things, hopped into the shower, and once I got out and started getting dressed, the beeping continued. Obviously, after being there and hearing the beeping, I became annoyed. The noise just got on my nerves, and I turned around to the alarm, and I said, Okay, you can stop now. And lo and behold, I shit you not, the beeping stopped right then and there. I mean, it literally stopped right then and there. In fact, I even posted this event on my on TripAdvisor because that's my bestie. That's where I post all my reviews. And yes, I do recommend this hotel. But, I mean, obviously you stay where you feel comfortable with. And always do your research, obviously. And if you don't want to stay at a haunted place, obviously avoid. But either way, this is about plotting and planning your dark corners travels. This is, this was, it was a good experience. Located at 919 Royal Street, it is still open for business, and it is probably still haunted. Okay, wow, we have covered so much. So many museums, boutique for vampires, places to go, places to eat, places to meet the red devil eyes. Um, But that is all I have for tonight. However, if you have a place that you would like to know where their dark corners are, or have a specific tourist attraction in mind, send me an email at wherethedarkcornersare at gmail.com. And also, please remember, I'm still looking for listener tales. If you have them. If you have a paranormal experience, that you had traveled somewhere, or you've been somewhere that uh, we've already covered, send me an email with your paranormal experience. Either way, until next time, please remember... Only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why I hope to meet you where the dark corners are. Mm